I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you for joining us here on Closing Arguments. And here we are. I mean, the Karen Reed trial continuing to churn along. This has turned into one of those jumbo trials here on your front row seat to justice. You realize that the trial began on April 29th? April 29th. Since then, yeah, we've had a couple half days here, an off day there. Um, but 19 days of testimony... 53 state witnesses, 19 days of testimony, 53 state witnesses, and the state's not done with their case. Um, so what I want to do tonight is go through um, the evidence that the state has put in so far to try to prove this murder case and take a look at some of the evidence that has come out during the prosecution's case um, that the defense says proves this conspiracy and cover-up. So. First segment, we'll do the prosecution. They have the burden. So let's get to some of their biggest evidence so far. And let's start with Karen Reed's alleged confession. This is crucial, crucial to their case. It's, it's who introduces the whole concept of John O'Keefe being struck by Karen Reed's car. According to the prosecution and their witnesses, it's Karen Reed herself introducing this idea um, to everyone there, the witnesses. Let's take a listen. After the fire department arrived and they sort of take over resuscitative efforts with regard to Mr. O'Keefe, what, if any, observations did you make of, of Ms. Reed and what she was doing or saying at that point? Well, Ms. Reed was um, visibly upset. Um, she kept saying, um, this is all my fault, this is my fault, I did this. As I was ventilating, I was able to ask, did anybody see anything, did anybody what happened and there was one individual that replied several times I hit him I hit him you indicated that the defendant said I hit him is that correct yes that's something that she said once or more than once? three times I hit him I hit him I hit him earlier it was could I did I when she spoke to the paramedic it was crystal clear I hit him so you've got more than one witness from all different places, right? EMT, police, um, friends uh, that were in the house tonight, all saying that she said that it was her fault, that she hit him, meaning struck him with her car. Now, what else does the prosecution have? Well, this is something that came up this week. We've been waiting for it. Um, the broken tail light. The, the broken taillight and the pieces of the, of the, of the taillight that are found at the scene. Let's take a look at the pictures we have. And first of all, there's the taillight itself, clearest picture that we have. You can see how uh, a lot of it has been broken out. So uh, where exactly did those pieces end up? Well, they're broken out from the car. Take a look. Even closer. You can see how the red is broken. Then you look on the ground, on the snow testimony that they dug out the area around it so what they weren't on top of the snow according to the witnesses they had to be dug out and we have some other uh, tail light pieces that are found in the snow as well so you've got the tail lights broken on a car the pieces of tail light are found underneath the snow near where john o'keefe's body was found finally what else what else did they have well all along, we've been hearing about John O'Keefe was found with just one shoe on, on his feet. Just one shoe, one sneaker. Where's the other shoe? Well, buried in the snow, according to investigators, according to the prosecution. You look at it there against the curb. The testimony was that it was beneath the snow, that it was behind some packed snow from the plows that had gone by. And it's on the street, on the curb, right near where John O'Keefe's body was found. So how compelling is this evidence? Because the prosecution case is a hit and run, right? Strikes him with her car and leaves. So you've got one shoe comes off, consistent with uh, other hit and runs that we've heard about in the past. The shoe is found near where the body was found. It's buried beneath the snow because we know that it didn't snow uh, until John O'Keefe, according to the prosecution case, until, until after John O'Keefe had been struck and was on the ground. So is this compelling? Does it make sense? Let's bring in our guests. 
Joining me tonight, Karen Reed's supporter, creator of the Justice for John O'Keefe and Karen Reed Facebook page, Nick Rocco. Also joining us, criminal defense attorney, college instructor, and author, Peter Ellikin. And finally, the YouTuber behind the Yellow Cottage Tales channel, Kevin Lanahan, is with us. Great to see everyone tonight. So I've laid out what I think are three of the most compelling pieces of evidence so far for the prosecution. They're not done. Got a couple more weeks, I think, left here. Um, Nick Rocco, does any of this move you? Does this not look like a hit and run, right? You've got pieces of the tail light. The whole concept of, of, of the SUV striking John O'Keefe is brought out by the defendant herself. And you've got the shoe from the victim at the scene underneath the snow. Well, the, the issue that I find is if John O'Keefe got hit by a car and it sent John flying, right, his shoe gets flown off of him, how does the taillight being, so if John gets hit by the taillight, it impacts on him, how does the taillight end up in the yard? Because on impact, the taillight would have broken and fallen on the ground right there in the street. So the first question I have is, how did that taillight end up in the yard? And then another, another thing I have with the shoe is, if he got hit by this vehicle, right, and his shoe comes flying off, what caused the scratches on his arm? How did he get those scratches on his arm? If he got hit by the car and, and goes flying, the, the, you can't explain those scratches. But like I said last night, the fact that none of this was found with only four inches of light snow on the ground being moved around with a snowblower, but yet it was found 12 hours later with a foot and a half of snow on the ground, it, it does, it's like beating a dead horse at this point. It, none of this makes sense. Those, those on his arm right there are from a dog. I mean, it's, there's a reason why Chloe is, quote unquote, rehomed to Vermont, when they could easily provide uh, evidence of where the dog is. Get the owner in court of, of who has Chloe. Bring Chloe into court if they have to, to prove that Chloe's alive. Where's the dog? P Peter Ellikin, uh, prosecutors say they have direct evidence, a confession by the defendant and strong circumstantial evidence, a broken taillight, broken taillight pieces at the scene near where the body was found, and the missing shoe of the victim. Does this not look like a classic hit and run? Uh, no, not at all. There's just too many questions uh, and there's too many holes in every bit of this evidence. First of all, as far as her doing a confession, uh, Jennifer McCabe was there on the scene she uh, then gives a, she's in front of a grand jury and says that um, Karen Reed was simply saying, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? And then uh, somewhere way down the line, suddenly Jennifer changes her story to saying, uh, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. And so I think there's just some real credibility questions there. Uh, as far as the taillight, that was just discussed too. The police were on the scene, first uh, responders were on the scene, the police did a search where the body was looking for pieces of, of any evidence at all. They came up with no tail light. They even brought that um, uh, leaf blower there to try to clear the area. There wasn't much snow there. Then hours and hours and hours later, suddenly it all appears and it's visible and it's easy to see from the road. It really falls into the defense uh, case of um, uh, that the, the thing was set up. So you have kind of reasonable doubt on every one of these cases. None of this is, uh, none of this is nailed down at all. Uh, the shoe in the snow, uh, they, when they dragged the body, if they, uh, under the defense theory, if they dragged the body out there, yeah, the shoe could have come off. That's not proof positive. That, and at some point, there was a plow. I think that was the only thing that was really under with the plowed part was the shoe. And um, so those are the three bits of evidence. If that's the best they have, and that is the strongest they have, and I can't say it's nothing, but it just isn't enough. Kevin Lenahan. Your thoughts about this big evidence, and, and what else um, do you think, if anything, prosecutors need to try to prove this case? Well, I can clear some things up for my friends here as far as the evidence. So John was knocked onto the lawn about five or six, six feet back. The snow underneath him did not accumulate because of his body temperature. So he was found on bare grass. When they took the leaf blower out, that's where they were searching. But you can see in the video that there is a small a small plowed bank from the plow that had come by before that. That's where the sneaker, 
and the taillight pieces were found because that's where the impact was on the street and they were plowed up into the curb. You could see the sneaker up against the curb. So the physical evidence, there's no, the Canton police never went out with a shovel and dug at that scene. So they never were gonna find that evidence. It wasn't until the CERT team came later that found it. And just briefly on, you know, I've never, I've always said what Karen said at the crime scene has always been hard for me to actually interpret. I think Jen's been consistent on it actually, that Karen was, asking could I have hit it until she got to the scene. Then when she got to the scene, that kind of changed. But even if she misheard that, the important testimony for me is the only really statement of Karen's that matters to me is when she called Kerry Roberts on the phone at a little before 5 a.m. and said, John's dead. Now there's, and then hung up and then called back and said, John was hit by a plow maybe or something like that. There is no reason that Karen should have suspected that John was in any danger just because she had dropped him off a few hours earlier and he hadn't come home. He, she, she would have assumed that he was out partying, sleeping on someone's couch or something like that. There was no reason for Karen to think unless she knew in the back of her mind what had happened. All right, let's do this. Everyone's staying. We've got more to get to up next. What is the biggest piece of evidence so far to prove Karen Reed's alleged conspiracy? We'll take a look at three big pieces of the puzzle. In 2011, Karen Swift returned home from a Halloween party and was never seen alive again. Weeks later, her body was found near a cemetery. The case then went cold for over a decade. Now, her estranged husband faces trial for her murder. The couple was going through a bitter breakup. But did divorce lead David Swift to kill? The Karen Swift murder trial, live coverage weekday mornings, only on Court TV. Karen Reed was framed. Her car never struck John O'Keefe. She did not cause his death. And that means that somebody else did. Bold opening statement from uh, David Yannetti and, and the uh, defense in the Karen Reed case. But that is their case. That is their case. So let's get to the evidence that has uh, come out through the prosecution's case, through some cross-examination. Uh, first thing, and, and this is a big one, the hose long to die in cold search. This, y y y the protest, this is the foundation of the Karen Reed movement, I believe, and the Karen Reed uh, a conspiracy defense. So let's take a look at that moment of cross-examination. You see this first search that says hose long to die in cold? I do. What's that time? You've got the, um, it's right over, 2.27. A.M. or P.M.? A.M. Ms. McCabe, you made that search at 2.27 a.m. because you knew that John O'Keefe was outside in your sister's lawn dying in the cold, didn't you? Absolutely not. She denied it, but the jury certainly saw that, that printout. Now, another thing that I think has bothered a lot of folks, a lot of people I was talking to at, at CrimeCon, uh, the phone activity, the, the crazy phone activity. Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, butt dials and uh, discarded phones. Take a listen. At 2.22 and 35 seconds, you received a call from Brian Albert, duration of one second, correct? Yes. In other words, Brian Albert called you at 2.22 and 35 seconds, but it looks like you missed the call, correct? I see the one-second call, yes. There's a second call just below that. On the same date, at 2.22 and 52 seconds, from you to Brian Albert, do you see that one? Yes. And the duration of that call is 22 seconds, correct? I see that, yes. So 17 seconds after you missed a call, according to these records, from Brian Albert, you called him back, and there was a call lasting 22 seconds. Is that right? That's what the records say. You say you inadvertently called him at 2.22 in the morning. Yes. 
How did you inadvertently call him? Well, I don't know because it was inadvertent. <laughs> so I have to explain that. Well, it's kind of like a butt dial. In September of 2022, you were served with a preservation order for your phone, were you not? Yes. After September of 2022, you never received anything in writing that canceled or lifted that preservation order, correct? That's correct. After September of 2022, you made the decision to dispose of your phone without consulting anybody about the decision to throw out your phone, correct? Yes. So Mr. Lally said that there was, that the defense had filed a motion to ask for the phones to be preserved. You just took the information that he gave you and hung up the phone and what about your business? Yes. Without notifying him that the very phone that he had just ordered you to preserve had just been destroyed days earlier. No, the phone wasn't destroyed. I upgraded the phone. And finally, how about Colin Albert, the 17-year-old, his injured knuckles. The jury has seen these photos um, from Fenway Johnny's. So let's bring back in our guest, Nick Rocco, Peter Ellican, Kevin Lenahan. Kevin, I mean, to me, this is some problematic stuff, especially the funny phone business going on. Well, first of all, the Knuckles, there was another picture introduced at trial that's closer to the 29th, and they show Colin's Knuckles clean. Um, so I don't think there's an issue there. As far as the butt dials, you know, the witnesses were probably not completely forthcoming on that, um, or at least in terms of why they got rid of their phones. But that just means they probably had other things on their phones that they didn't want to be made public. And in this case, we can all see why, right? And then finally, on 227, there's so many ways I can rebut this. But let's just go with this. Imagine Matt and Jen McCabe leaving that house at 1.30, driving home to their four daughters. If they know that the plan is to leave John to die in the cold, then they are accomplices to murder and a high-risk crime. If, if John was attacked by a German shepherd and was beat up, a medical examiner is likely to find that. So they're risking that their four kids are going to grow up without parents because they're going to jail. Then they go home and Jen McCabe is just calmly uh, searching for her basketball league that the co and texting the coach for her daughter's basketball league that had asked her to join up at a microsecond before this data shows her searching for how long to die Nicole. It just doesn't make any okay. sense. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Peter Alekin, wh what is this stuff equal at this point? Does the defense need to bring oh. out more in their case? Uh, they've got a, a ton of evidence at this point. I mean, first of all, the phone calls, uh, everybody claims that they're butt dialing. Now, that's a possibility that that could happen to somebody, but everybody, Jennifer McCabe is butt dialing, Brian Albert is butt dialing, Brian Higgins is, and they're all like responding all at the same time that night. Uh, that, that's just a strange credi credibility. Also, everybody in that house seems to have either deleted their phones or like Higgins, uh, takes his phone, throws it out, and drives to a military base and, and throws it out. So that uh, that just doesn't pass the smell test. As far as uh, Colin Albert, I mean, here's somebody who testified he's never been in a fight in his life, and then they play a video of him very angrily threatening to, to kick people, you know, to beat up people. And then they, when they look at his uh, photos of his bruised knuckles, he said, well, you know, one of his things was, well, I got that on the heavy bag. The heavy bag is something boxers practice with. It's not your general gotcha. gym thing. So before I run I, out I think of time, might... before I run out of time, let me just get from Nick. Nick, what else th is, is ahead here for the defense? What do you expect to see relative to this conspiracy? About 30, 30 seconds. Well, I believe the defense is going to have some sort of eyewitness that's going to put two people behind Karen Reed's vehicle in the Sally Port. You have you now have three videos of Colin Albert in a fist fight, not just one anymore. So that was a lie. He's been in multiple fights before. And you have nine butt dials. All of these things were deleted from Jennifer McCabe. Higgins wants to say his phone was compromised due to the fact that uh, 
you know, a, a target got his phone number. All he had to do was call his carrier and change his phone number. There was no reason to destroy the phone. And if that was the case, he could have turned the phone in and got an upgrade for a discounted price. Why go and buy a brand new cell phone and pay a thousand dollars for a new iPhone when you could just when you could do what Brian Albert did and upgrade your phone? I mean, we, none of this none of this makes sense. These people. We're out of time for to tonight. I hate old. to cut you off. We're out of time for tonight. Nick Rocco, Peter Elkin, Kevin Lennon. Let's do it tomorrow.